Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, welcome to the virtual first Wednesday opening for our uh, March 2021 exhibition. My name is Jason Andreessen. I'm the uh, president and CEO for Baton Rouge Gallery. It is a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, we've got an incredible show for you this month. Uh, tonight will be your first look at it. There are four artists showing, uh, Matt Morris, Libby Johnson, Daniel Burns, and Leslie Kopcho. Uh, Libby and uh, Leslie actually making their debut after becoming uh, artist members in the fall of 2019. So this is their first exhibition with us since then, and we are thrilled to have them with us. So uh, we look forward to sharing their works with you all this month. So we'll uh, take walk through the gallery and you can see them tonight. And then hopefully you'll come and see them in person. This show is up through April 1st. And the gallery is free and open to the public every day but Monday from noon to six. So come by and see us sometime soon. Uh, before we do a walkthrough and allow you to hear from the artists themselves, we want to say a quick word of thank you to all of our members and donors who have been uh, so generous in supporting the gallery, especially during these strange and unpredictable times. Uh, we wouldn't be here without you. So to all of our members, all of our donors, thank you so much for all that you make possible at the gallery. Um, and if you're not already a donor or a member, you can head over to batonrougegallery.org and uh, sign up to become a member there. There are monthly membership levels starting uh, it, for every budget range. Um, you can give at a monthly level or at an annual level. So uh, head over there and check that out. Uh, like I said, I also wanna say thank you to uh, one of our partners since 1984, Breck, giving us our beautiful home here in City Park. Thank you to Breck and all that they've made possible here at the gallery over the years. So with that, I'll say thank you again, and I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Matt Morris, our first artist for the night. You'll hear from all four, but first up, we'll hear from Matt Morris. Uh, I'm going to switch my camera around if everybody will give me just a moment. Hey, Matt. Hey, Jason, how are you? Great, how are you? I'm well. Give me just a moment. I'm going to see if I can switch my camera around. Bear with me. All right. So here we are in the front gallery. And Matt, we're gonna go ahead and start here with these two works, if you like. And you can just start by telling everybody about your new exhibition, Planets. Okay, um, first, before we begin, I just wanted to say uh, thanks to everyone for being here and a special thanks to any board members that have managed to tune in tonight. Um, appreciate it. I know that we'd all like to be there in the gallery um, for the usual party, but Technology is going to uh, help us do it virtually, so I'm glad that everyone is here. Um, you know, during the, the pandemic, we've all been uh, isolating somewhat, um, some more than others. You know, it depends on what you do for work, if you're able to uh, work remotely, or um, also it depends on can you afford risk, how much risk can you afford. But we've all been in our own little planet to some extent, um, some more than others, right? And some of us do that anyway. Some of us are always in our own planet, um, but that's been really kind of difficult for, for others. And, you know, um, I think some of us would like to share our planet. You know, at this point, we'd like to share our planet. Or maybe there are, there are other people who are on someone else's planet and they would like to get off of it at this point. Um, but th this is my chance to to make some some, uh, create some new planets and and ho uh, hopefully you like them. So Jason, um, you know, a lot of people don't know the difference between a rabbit and a hare. Are you aware of that? <laughs> I would count myself among them, frankly. Well, you know, a rabbit is born uh, blind, naked, and afraid, and and a hare on the other hand, is born uh, completely furred out, eyes wide open, I mean, ready to bounce, right? So that's what's okay. up. I had some, somebody was in the gallery earlier today and described it as a, the, the uh, figure in this piece as a uh, rabbit slash hippo hybrid. So do with that information what you will. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I like it. Um, Hazi, that's that's um that's a hair of Deutsch. Do you you yeah. Jason? You've got a, a little bit of Spanish skills, right? Si. Poquito. So, do you know any German? Uh, no. Yeah. No. You're gonna have to learn some. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, these along this long wall, I made the decision to hang those in um, like a gentle arc. I was thinking about a reference to their celestial nature. You know, you'll see um, p diagrams of, of phases of the planets and uh, where they are in position day after day and they change. Um, and so it'll create this gentle arc. And hanging these two together, these two small pieces together, I was inspired to do that um, actually by Libby, who's who you're gonna hear from in a, in a few moments and a good friend of mine. And she uh, has a painting of the conjunction of um, Jupiter and Saturn that happened back at, around Christmas time. So I was inspired to hang those two little ones really close together. And I think that sort of quirky um, part of it sort of really helped make that arc kind of come, come to life for, for the, the rest of that wall. This one, um, recently obsolete technology. So that's what we got here. Um, that's a landline, that, that red one. Jason, you have a landline at home? Uh, no. I didn't think so, right? Who does? I mean, <laughs> my parents are in their 80s and they don't even have a landline at home. Um, that one's a cordless. And then uh, there's a television down there too, almost obsolete technology, or at least CRT tube televisions are obsolete technology. Remember when we were all trying to kill our TVs? We kind of succeeded, didn't we? But then um, those screens, they're insidious. They, they made it uh, into other places. Like now they're in their, our, our pockets on our phones. I'm looking at one right now. In our, in our artwork. Yes. Um, well, I'm interested in, in obsolete technology because it, it typically becomes elevated as an art form. So uh, if you take black and white photography, for example, um, you know, in the museum space, the space for photography for decades, it was all black and white because color was uh, like vulgar um, because it was commercial. So could I, could I push the edge of it? Could I, where is the line? When is something obsolete? When does it become art? If I had a gasoline engine and I made art out of it, could it, could I make it obsolete? Um, the alien landscape here, we've got um, the, the relationship of the dog to the car. Even if it's in a new world, uh, we still have to figure it out. The dog is in the dark, car is in the light. Is the dog going to have uh, a positive relationship with the technology of the vehicle? Uh, or, or negative one? Is it going to chase it and bite the tires, or is it going to accept it and get inside, ride along with his tongue hanging out the window? Um, yeah, that's what that's about. Hmm. Matt, can you talk about the transition to uh, using these round panels as opposed to the rectangular panels that you were using years ago? Glad you asked that question, Jason. Um, You're more because, than welcome. You know, uh, the typical way of looking at uh, an image, a picture, a photograph, a painting um, is as if it's a window into another world. Like we could look out a window if it's a rectangle or a square. Um, so the circle is uh, it's a way to try to depart from that so that I'm trying to make it appear to be more of an object. And also shooting with a very short lens of um, a six and a half millimeter sort of fish eye effect lens also creates the illusion that it's an orb. So I think it sort of uh, makes it even more of an object. So instead of a window into another world, I'm trying to create an, an actual planet, an actual globe or an orb, make it more like an object of art instead of uh, a window. We've got here, Jason, we've got wings. We've got two wings there. Um, are you going to ask me if I have wings? <laughs> I'm going to ask you if you could touch either wing. Are, are they real or, or artificial? I, you know, like one is painted, one is plastic. I guess they're both artificial, aren't they? I mean, I could touch them because I have them here in my studio, but you've just got a picture of them. <laughs> um, yeah. Illusion and reality is what this piece is all about. Mm-hmm. 
Jason, if you and I were on a carousel, oh boy, and I was on one horse and you were on another one, would I ever catch up to you? This feels like a trick question I can't possibly answer correctly. I wouldn't, could I? I mean, we'd just go around and around and around. Um, but sometimes problems in our culture feels like that. Feels like we've been here before. Feels like we tried to work on these problems and we thought we made headway, but we keep coming back to the same place. I think we sometimes, you know, in the West, we think of time as a line, but maybe we should think of it as a cycle or a circle. So, you know, the carousel, it keeps, keeps going around and around. So this is about, um, you know, trying to solve a problem that keeps coming back. Hmm. And that last one there, Jason, is, um, is about free thinking. It's, this is um, uh, flamingos with a blue blender. I, I had a friend who, um, was babysitting a, a bird, a pet bird. And I was shocked when I realized that the bird, the cage was left open, like the little door on the cage, the bird could fly in and out and it would go back into the cage um, because I guess it felt comfortable there. And I'd never really been around a caged bird before. Um, and I was surprised by that. And it made me think about uh, an analogy for um, our own way of thinking. If we allow ourselves free thinking, can we open our mind up and uh, allow uh, our, our mind to come out of the cage? We tend to have, um, we tend to let it go back in. We tend to kind of stay in our own way of thinking. Um, so there's one flamingo that's in the cage, one flamingo that's out of the cage. Um, this is sort of like encouragement to allow yourself to think freely. Matt, where do you come across these objects? Um, I'm always looking for choice material on the side of my road, and um, I'll just throw it in the back of the pickup. Uh, televisions, they're everywhere, right? Everyone's trying to get rid of a TV, and nobody wants the CRT televisions. Um, you know, um, and the carousel horse, I mean, that thing, couldn't believe I found that. That was a real gem. And um, that was a roadside find? The, yes, believe it or not. Wow. It was, it was a roadside find. The flamingos, you know, they're everywhere. Flamingos are everywhere. Um, I, I was, you know, I'm always got my eye out for things that look good. And normally I'm looking for color. Um, you know, the, the flamingos, for example. Um, or anything that, that would look good photographically, texture, you know, just as an object. But I'm, I'm sort of um, into the idea of making art out of things that are, that are you know, discarded or, or trashed, like elevating things that, that were refuse, uh, especially plastic or something that's problematic that shouldn't be in a landfill. Um, if I can make art out of it one more time, then I feel like I'm doing something worthy. And I should mention that all the works you see tonight, uh, including Matt's, are uh, all available on our website. You can go to batonrougegallery.org slash current, where you've, you'll find links to all four exhibitions. Um, and you'll see each work. And you can actually purchase right from the website if you like to. Matt, anything else people should know about your, your exhibition and this body of work? That I'm really happy to have uh, finally had the chance to show with my good friend Libby Johnson that I've known for half my life, and um, I'm excited to hear from her next. And also uh, honored to show with my Goomba, Daniel Burns, my friend and colleague at BRCC. And it was uh, a pleasure getting to know Leslie Kopcho. So um, thank you, everyone, for being here. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thank you, Matt. Matt Morris's planets. And next up, we'll hear from one of our newest artist members, Libby Johnson, who has rejoined the galleries, uh, having been a, a past member, but starting in the fall of 2019 is back with us. Hi, Libby, how are you? Hey, Jason, how are you doing? 
Excellent. Excellent. Thank Good. you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. Oh, I'm excited about it. I'm excited about being back in the gallery. Yeah. Well, we're thrilled to have you. Really are. And I'm excited about showing with Matt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're um, kind of a, a little duo, I guess. We've known mm -hmm. each other so long. So, And our work seems to relate to each other, too, in, in color, at least. You know, so I think that made for a nice room in the gallery. No question. No question. Well, can you tell us a little bit about the works that are in your new show, Unknowing? Yeah, you know, actually, the, the work we're looking at right now are, are some older pieces. And all the paintings on the other wall are newer pieces. But, um, you know, the, the whole idea of calling the show Unknowing is just a, you know, obvious, um, obviously has to do with the pandemic and we're living in this horrible, horrible, unpredictable thing. And we don't know what's going to happen next. And so everything is in a state of unknowing, but I actually kind of like having that, that quality to my work anyway. And in this painting, um, if you, when you pull back from it, you'll see that it's a vase of roses and it's got kind of a, strange sky that looks like it could change at any moment. And what I really like to do is bring in different visual elements together in one work where that wouldn't, wouldn't at all be there in nature. I mean, mm -hmm. not only would you not have a vase of roses sitting out in the sunset probably, um, but just the, the idea that the, the roses are very solid and they're, on the table and they have weight and then you have all this flux going on behind them. Um, I really like bringing in that kind of two ideas together. And, um, you know, it's very important to me to think about the formal elements of painting. I really think, even though I'm a representative representational painter, that it's very important to have the abstract elements or the, um, formal elements as important, if not more so than the, the um, subject matter. And that's because we live in subject matter. You know, we see clouds and fields and roses and everything, but, you know, you have to really be conscious of what's underneath all that and how those images are made. And that is with color and shape and value. And so I really strive in my work to bring those formal elements up to the level of the um, subject matter. They kind of live together anyway. They, in a painting, I mean, you can't separate the two. Mm -hmm. So and lately- Libby, I'll, I'll walk through the gallery and if okay. you'd like me to jump around to different pieces, just, just say so. Okay, this is a painting um, from Spoleto, Italy. I've noticed you know, looking back on this year and looking at all the paintings that I made, which all of these smaller ones are part of, I'm noticing that I'm getting a lot more um, narrative because, you know, we're living in a pretty intense narrative situation and, you know, it just kind of, it's, it's there. You got to do something with it. So I think this is how I brought it out. Now this painting also, is an example of something new to me and that is painting directly from an actual photograph without combining the images. Um, this is actually somebody's backyard the night of the, um, the planet alignment. Um, and I saw this image on Facebook and I, I texted them and said, can I use that? That's an incredible photograph. And the stars were just like that. The planets were just like that in the um, original photograph. And I just got hooked on that drastic, drastic light that's illuminating that white tree and the idea that the, um, the planets are illuminating everything else, all of it, everywhere. This is another Venice painting. It's called Mooring and what I like to do is I work from a photograph, and this is also one that I really didn't change the photograph much. But I will then, after the painting is done, I'll have to I'll add a little 
narration to it, like the people were not in the photograph. And it's kind of like I've painted the stage set. And then I have to put, you know, the players in it. And it's kind of opposite of how you do actually in, in plays. You know, you do the drama and the characters and then you do the, the set. But I'm kind of doing it in an opposite way. This is called Cross Current, another Venice painting. You can tell I'm missing Venice. I usually go in the spring and God knows when I'll get back. But um, this is just that extreme illumination that I like to use going from real, real light to real dark and making drama from it. And if you notice the shapes in this painting are very flat, flatly painted. And I really like that too. I mean, I'm talking about the shapes in the water. Okay. This one is um, called Amusement. And this is another one that I painted the, the landscape and said, I need something in this painting other than just the greens and the golds of the sky. So I came up with the idea of putting a Ferris wheel in there because it was a totally different kind of light and um, it, it seemed to work. And it's kind of a mystery, you know, it's like, doesn't look like there could be a, an amusement park back there or a fair, but there it is. <laughs> this is called Under the Vasari Corridor and it's the place in Florence that's a walkway underneath the kind of walkway that the Medici's built from the Uffizi over to the Pitti Palace. And this is actually a photograph I made with that woman walking in it. And um, I don't know, I just really was intrigued by her. So I kind of painted that one just like it was, maybe a few changes. Libby, as we walk through, would you mind talking to us a little bit about your technique and how you actually create these works? No, not at all. Um, I usually lay in the painting. Well, I'll, I'll figure out the colors first and see if that um, color relationship is happening from the material I use to make the paintings. If that's okay, and that's kind of given me a jolt, which I always like, then I'll lay in a painting very loosely just to get some color down all over. And um, then I'll just go, it takes me forever to mix my palette. So I, I just, I don't think anybody would ever want to paint like me. But, um, it takes me forever. And then when I finally get that done, I'll go in and start putting another layer, another layer. And they're not, um, they're not indirect painting. The layers are, you know, themselves. You can't see through anything. It's just, I'm putting layer after layer until I feel like I have a good painted surface and all the values and colors look okay. You know, I think the surface of a painting is extremely important and it's something maybe people don't think about a whole lot. Just, there's a kind of just feel like, you know, it just feels, if you could touch it, it feels good, you know, just very important thing. So I build up and build up and build up till I have that. And then I put the little narrative in it, the cartwheel, which is the name of this painting. I don't know if you can see that little person doing the <laughs> cartwheel. <laughs> this was from Ford's Pasture, which is a place that was just woods and fields and sheep. And I'm sure people from Baton Rouge remember it, but um, you know, the it's kind of, get torn away now because of Ruzan. And so I painted this from a photograph I took over there. And so since it reminded me of my childhood so much, that's why I decided to go with that cartwheel person. This is called approach. And, you know, I've always wanted to paint either a tornado or a thunderstorm. Um, it's just such power involved in it. And I really, really had fun doing this painting. And I, so I had the, the picture of the 
the storm and then I just added that landscape to it. Um, Red Lagoon. I photographed this one night in Venice and you know, I, I kind of thought this was going to be a really nice painting to make, but when I looked at the photograph in my camera, I couldn't believe it. I mean, this is exactly what my photograph looked like, but because it was a photograph, it was flattened out and it became more abstract. And, you know, it, it was so important to me, this photograph, I almost was scared to paint it. It's kind of like when I was trying to do a drawing of St. Francis's tomb in Assisi, and I realized that, you know, this, this tomb should not be made into any, uh, in, into a drawing. It's just too important. So I just quit. And I kind of felt like that about this painting too, that, you know, it was kind of sacred because it, it was such a weird photograph that I felt there were other, other things at work in it. Mm -hmm. But I enjoyed doing it in the end. This is a um, painting of a little cafe that's on my walking route in, in Venice. And, you know, I had these people sitting there when I took the picture, all those people were actually in the photograph, but then I wanted another element in it, some, something a little uneasy. So that's why I put the cat. I like to put animals in paintings too. Oh. This painting um, is a painting of my street on a real rainy, rainy afternoon. And I, the name of it is Walking to Paris, Paradise. And the reason I named it that is it's got my dog, Luca, who um, I used to take for walks, you know, up and down that part of the street. and the last day he was alive, the day that I was going to have to put him down, uh, my friend Judy Kahn came over and, and helped me go through this day. And we both took Luca for a walk and he just kind of collapsed halfway through it. And she says, yeah, I think it's time, you know, just everybody knows who loves animals. That's a really hard thing to do. So anyway, this is Luca walking to paradise. And there's St. Francis. I just called it Francis. I, I really, I really like Francis. I mean, not the painting, which I like too, but I mean, I really have a thing about St. Francis, maybe because of the animals. Hmm. Well, Libby, it's a beautiful show and we're really Thank excited you. to have your, your work in the gallery. Somebody's asking me, about mm -hmm. who influences me um, from art history. And um, I think, gosh, they, they come from all over. Bernini um, from Venice, for sure. He's got this uncanny uh, way of painting landscapes that I really took a lot out of. And um, I'm wish I had written these down before. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's a million of them. There's a million of them. So um, anyway, Kelsey, let me think on that a minute. Well, and again, all of these works, uh, you can see them online at batonridgegallery.org slash current, where you can find links to all four artists. And every one of these works are there. You can get a second look at them, purchase them if you like or you can certainly come by the gallery anytime before April 1st and see them in person. And they really are stunning. So thank you, Libby. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. I enjoyed it. All right. We're going to make our way into the back gallery where we'll hear from our last two artists. And first up will be Danielle Burns. Just a moment here. All right. Danielle, if you're with us. Hey, Danielle, how are you? Hey, uh, how's it going? Good. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. And thanks for doing this. <laughs> you guys, keeping us connected, you know, outside of these, um, the void that the, you know, we're all missing the first 
um, Wednesdays, but this is yeah. such an incredible way to stay connected and hear. I mean, and to follow that work. I mean, <laughs> you artists were incredible. I'm, I'm kind of awestruck right now. So um, the bar has been set. Now you just have to clear it. Yeah, here we go. All right. So um, recognitions. Um, all of the work, um, mixed media, it's a little bit of a departure for me from my usual prints. Um, they were all created during and in direct response to quarantine. Um, they are, um, you know, they were therapeutic in a sense, but also just a way to sort of um, control the days. I'm not, I'm sure I'm not alone in um, noticing that when you start working from home, um, days are really weird um, because they they blur together, but then they stretch. So they speed by, but then it's eight o'clock and you don't know what you did that day. Um, so, you know, creating during this time was like a really nice way to sort of like take control and also kind of keep me away from the doom scrolling that um, was really, really easy to get kind of caught up into um, at the beginning of all of this and also currently. So um, one of the practices, um, you know, to kind of like keep the screen right there, but not doom scroll the newsfeed was to um, go back and um, look at my camera roll. So it was like a, a joyful sort of scrolling and it was, um, it was interesting because I would like look at these photos of a very, very recent past, but I was looking at them in and through a lens that you might look at like old family photos, you know, like there was a, a bit of like nostalgia that came with something that happened just like weeks prior, months prior when you're sitting, you know, and, you know, trying to avoid sort of um, the catastrophe that's happening worldwide. So um, I found that like, and it's something that I'd been investigating already or before in previous work, you know, both coping, but also um, like these shifts in narrative when you're uh, reconsidering um, memories. So as I was looking through these photos, I noticed that these like narratives that I thought like, you know, childhood memories like took time to mature and um, develop, um, they were instant, you know, like with the change of context of the world, like your um, perspective changed dramatically too. So I'd look at um, these photos taken just weeks or months uh, prior in a completely new lens, like with a whole new perspective of, um, you know, sometimes cringy, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You know, it's the whole bag of nostalgia, you know, that comes with nostalgia. Um, it's like a bag of regret and, um, you know, longing and, um, you know, everything that comes with like reminiscing. Mm -hmm. So, um, so um, the paintings are pairs. Um, I started with um, creating sort of um, the setting. Right, so all of these are um, combinations and um, compilations of different settings that I found in like the very again recent um, fun and and different narratives and um, settings that we found ourselves in when we were working from home. Um, so I'd compile them together and create um, an invented landscape um, because I didn't want to reference direct memories or specific um, times or places. Um, so the one that you're looking at um, is called Safer Over Here. The pool that you're seeing isn't actually in a bayou and it doesn't actually have um, setting suburbia um, in the reeds, but I wanted to sort of create um, backgrounds like classic um, animation would work where they have these highly detailed backgrounds and then they have the figures that sort of move on top of them. 
So that's why I wanted, and I was really drawn to mixed media because I wanted to have graphite on top of these very like detailed and more saturated um, permanent backgrounds. So these are graphite mixed with um, acrylic. Um, there's a couple of instances of textile foil when I was just playing with um, reflection and different things like that. But I like the um, impermanence of the graphite because I'm talking about changing perspectives. And I thought that like something like a drawing, you know, you could just go in and erase a gesture. And I thought that that was a, a really nice kind of dichotomy between the two. This one's called The Last Summer. Um, this is one of those where it's sort of cringy to think about that happening now. <laughs> you know, everybody just hanging out in some, and I think this was the, the A meet, but um, the grouping of people, like, I mean, that's something that just seems so distant. It's such a distant memory. It's the simpler times, right? Um, so the shifting perspectives in the figure are really important to me because that's what I'm feeling when I'm looking back at these. And also they're they're paired together, but they're um, they're not connected in the show because there's no clear, feeling about anything because everything's so in flux still that, um, you know, I'm not sure to feel cringy or nostalgic about it. Like, do I long for this or am I like, maybe we should have got our stuff together a little bit mm. <laughs> earlier. Um, so that's a little triptych um, called Last Summer, but also The Last Summer. Danielle, can you talk about uh media a little bit more because I think a lot of people who might be familiar with your work or, or your recent shows might think of you, shows here anyway, uh, might think of you and consider you as a printmaker. And can you talk about being a mixed media artist and, and you know, employing these different media in these works? Yes. And thank you for the question, Jason. Absolutely. Excellent question. <laughs> um, yeah, because as much as um, quarantine influenced um, sort of the subject arena to explore and the theme of the work, it definitely um, changed my uh, medium, right? So I teach at BRCC and there's a lovely um, print shop that I have access to that I um, did not anymore. So there's an added element of nostalgia in that um, instead of kind of clinging on to um, print processes and trying to do at home DIY um, print techniques, I re-embraced my, um, my painting background, which it's been years and years since I was actually a painting major in undergrad. And it's been so, so long since I made an acrylic painting. And I don't know if I can claim ever having finished one actually. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> talking about nostalgia, but also, um, you know, filling those idle hands, you know, if you're having to relearn a process and um, it, it slows you and it was therapeutic to go in and like, just be able to focus in on a single line of waves in a painting and like really just try to relearn um, blending, you know, I mean, mm. like it's so <laughs> different than the layering that I'm used to. Um, and something else and that changed dramatically was color, the use of color in the work um, and printmaking. And I'm still totally a fan of like desaturated and, and muted colors, but there was something about like thinking nostalgically and being reminiscent of like days gone by maybe there's not a lot of grass in the work but the grass is always greener right so as mm -hmm. i was depicting this like and having that palette and that full palette it was a way to create beauty and saturation and color that i was missing so it was it was really nice to have that sort of chroma to work with hmm.
Okay. Anything else that people should know about recognitions before they come out in droves to see the show in person? Come out in droves. <laughs> Um, there is something that like the camera doesn't really capture and it's one of those like, um, when you when you get up to it, it's um, a nice little detail. But I was playing with hot foil um, textile foiling, which is usually a screen printing technique. But um, it was something that I, I found with like PVA and an iron at home can also do that. And there's um, a lot of like reflective qualities um, in the pieces that you might not be able to see that much, but, um, you know, it was so much about like self-reflection that I thought that I needed some sort of holographic color technique in there, but that's probably the printmaker talking in me. So <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you, Danielle. Thank we you. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. And again, all of these works are on the gallery's website, batonersgallery.org. You can see every one of them there. Next, we're going to bring in one of our other new artist members, Leslie Kopcho, who will tell us about the works in her very first exhibition with us. Hey, Leslie, how are you? Hi, doing great. I'm very honored to be here. And what a night. Such great artists to share the space with. And yeah. I'm excited to be here. Wonderful. Well, let me not uh, delay things anymore. Why don't you tell us uh, about your show and, and about these works? And again, if you would like me to jump around the gallery a little bit, just okay. say the word. Well, I've always been really, I guess, just have a great love of nature. It's diversity and variety. Um, I'm really interested in some the emotional connections too that might, might remind us of what it means to be human. So empathy and survivability are important issues in my work. And I guess in a modest sense, trying to just hint at some of the mysteries that might exist there. And this is Brucinichia papyrifera, which is basically the paper mulberry plant. It's a highly invasive species that you can find even here in Baton Rouge. And I was attracted by the bright orange fruit of the the plant, and I also use it to make paper. Mm -hmm. So if you happen to have this plant in your yard, I will be glad to take it off your hands because it makes mm -hmm. amazing paper. Here's some lace paper that I've I've made from, from that particular plant. And I consider nature my backyard, the LSU campus. There are a lot of, um, you know, recently inspired by um, plant form. I use some of the botanical names just so that I can learn them, right? I'm trying to learn a lot of the botanical names. I've grown up collecting all kinds of things from nature, but to look at the scientific, the scientific names and learn those as well as the common names and the plants. So this particular um, set of four is a series and I really enjoy printmaking because of its the idea of a generative matrix, I think it's the perfect medium for my work. The ability for it to show variety, I'm more interested in how those elements can be reproduced to create something new and imaginative as opposed to more of the same. So I feel like these are like a family, right? More so than, um, that I create editions of prints. I love to draw. I take photographs. We can hang on a second. Just go back one second mm -hmm. to that four. Some of the tops are digital chine collé. So I take photographs. I love to draw. I love ink. I love paper. But that particular one with the dragonfly wing, I was inspired. I'd collected a lot of the fruit from the mulberry plant. And the stains were quite beautiful, almost like a watercolor that existed. And so I took that and I collaged and printed at the same time. So I like to interchange those parts. Yeah, there's some plants in Spanish Town. I think I see, see that note there. 
I'd love to take them off your hands. I know there was a campaign to get rid of them. They're highly invasive, but they're so beautiful. Sort of like orange fireworks. The seeds are very prolific as well as the root systems. They seem to grow in a variety of ways, but they are one of the plants that are used in Japanese paper making and they grow here in Baton Rouge. How many plates or colors are involved? I do lose count. I do <laughs> copper plates and then I've interchanged those with some of the photographs that then I've collaged and printed on. So the second one is collage print. So I, I sort of see this more as a family of prints, just the way it might be a genus and a species, or just like all of us, we're alike, but different. Our genetic code is so similar, just takes one small thing to uh, create a new variety. So that's what inspires me. And I think that that's why printmaking is the perfect medium for my work because of that idea of its generative matrix. Hmm. The, the next one there is, I just called it Mulberry Cluster 1, and there's a 2 where I've developed the print a little bit further and added more color. And I enjoy seeing, like, I feel like the prints are more complete, seeing them together as, like, as a family rather than alone. So we might want to go from this one to the other mulberry cluster and just compare, right? See the differences. I'd like to develop the plates, scrape and burnish and create something new from the copper. So this one has a lot more color. It's several, several uh, copper plates. And this was, again, based on a photograph. I had gone out and collected a bunch of these fruits. I tried to freeze them, to save them. They were really, I guess, very perishable and fragile. And so I tried to capture the essence of that oh, luminosity in the fruit and mm -hmm. try just try different combinations. It frames so beautifully as well. The larger prints came before the paper mulberry set or family. And this one is Cyclus Revoluta Luce Verde, which simply means sago palm light green. So this was from a inspired by a photograph and a visit to a sago palm that was on the campus of LSU. And it was it was surreal. The color in the plant was amazing. It didn't even seem like it was realistic. And I took photos, I began to draw. And once I start drawing on a plate, it just evolves. So they become more abstracted and more, I would say internal, right? I'm trying to look for those connections between the flora and fauna and humankind, almost like a comparative bio biologist would work. So this one, you know, the seeds reminded me of propagation and uh, reproduction on, I guess, different scales, both human and with flora and fauna. And this piece is actually featured on the, the mask of yours. Yes. Uh, that the gallery has been producing. So if anybody would like this on a face mask. Yeah. Dive deep into our website and you will find them there. <laughs> and so this is great to come to this one next, which has the same title, but with the addition of tenebris, which just simply means dark. So I developed those same plates and scraped, burnished, created aquatints so that there was a whole different um, feel temperature wise to the print and integrity wise. So this was, I guess, much uh, darker in tone and, and temperature, but created from the same plates. Yeah, certainly. Like, really inspired by the seeds. The whole idea of propagation, right, makes sense with printmaking. Again, I feel like it's, it, the press itself inspires me to be able to create variety and unity in the world, in my artwork. Yeah, the, obviously the glare of the, the gallery lights makes that one a little tough to capture on camera, but 
Yeah, it's tough to do to document too. Sure. And the last one is inspired by the river birch plant or tree, I should say, which is also called the black birch. And I have one in my backyard. And this thing just completely like a phoenix, this, the bark peels and peels. So it's basically a new tree every day. And it's much like us where our skin is sloughed off and we're renewed um, each day by our cells changing. Mm. But I look outside and it's a new tree every day and I've drawn this thing over and over. So it, I like the physical nature of printmaking, the ability to draw and see its uh, physical properties as well as the multiple. And I probably, there probably are a few in this series from these same plates, but this one worked nicely with the, the triptych that was in the gallery. A nice compliment, I think, you know, color wise and a little flatter in surface and less deeper volumetric. So I enjoy that they, again, that I think they work well together as a group. Mm -hmm. Question. Leslie, anything else that you think folks should know before coming to see this work in person? Uh, trying to think anything <laughs> that I meant to say. Well, Leslie, I know I know you've been a part of, of art in Baton Rouge for a long time. So it's it's a real honor for us to have you in the gallery and and have this be your your first show with us. So thank you for being a part of the gallery and thank you for sharing uh, this body of work with us. It's, it's my pleasure. And I think they are best seen in, in person because of the surfaces. Mm -hmm. But I guess just think like a comparative biologist when you go in and I really enjoy the interchangeability of, of, of parts and trying to create something new, just like nature does. Right, well said, well said. Well, thank you, Leslie. We appreciate it. You're Have welcome. A wonderful rest of your night. Thank you so much. All right. Well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Hope you've enjoyed the show. And again, uh, all of these works are available on uh, the gallery's website, batonrougegallery.org slash current. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed them. Uh, please come by and see us sometime. Uh, the show is open until January, or sorry, January, <laughs> April 1st. Uh, the gallery is free and open to the public every day, but Monday from noon to six. Uh, come see these works in person. Again, our thanks to all four artists, Danielle Burns, Leslie Copcho, Matt Morris, and Libby Johnson. Uh, and if you're on Instagram, we're going to uh, reload and basically do this all again. Uh, if you'd like to join us on Instagram, that's at BR Gallery, uh, and we'll uh, take another walk through the gallery, but come by and see us before April 1st and you can take your own walk through the gallery. So thank you again. Have a good night. Uh, BatonRougeGallery.org for more information on this show and everything else related to the gallery. See you soon. Thank you. Have a good night.